So, David, why plants? You visited it in 2D brilliantly uh, several years ago. Why, why did you turn this into 3D? Well, uh, there are some positive reasons, and there are some reasons you might say were sort of um, negative, perhaps. Uh, one of the things about working in 3D uh, is that the camera is huge. It takes four people to carry. Uh, and it also very temperamental. It takes half a dozen people to keep it happy. Um, and so it's not the sort of thing that you want to use uh, if you're going to try and creep up on some sort of shy little animal crawling around on the African plains because you would scare the living daylights out of it. You'd never get near it. Not only that, but there are, for technical reasons, of very important technical reasons, you can't use long focus lenses either. Um, but what you can do, and what it does absolutely marvellously, um, is close-up stuff. And, of course, plants in close-up uh, are, are marvellous, but plants in time-lapse are more than marvellous. They are riveting, Nick, interesting, when you suddenly speed up and you see things that, of course, no human being has ever seen before, uh, if you pick the right plant. If, until you see it in, in time-lapse, you can't know what it's going to do or what excitement it's going to give you. And all I can tell you in summary is that, from our experience, plants in time-lapse, close-up, colour, 3D, uh, and is just breathtaking. Um, I was amazed at uh, that stuff you saw there, that insect that eating in sundew plant. It looks, to me, one of the most dramatic things I've seen on television for a long time. So that in itself is a good reason, I reckon, for, for going to film plants. Now, the, 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 another thing which was, was the reason wasn't it for you is because of their, because we could get to all the plants there. Now, we didn't do everything there, but we did a la large majority, didn't we? Yes. Uh, um, the, uh, with, with all that gear, of course, you want to be near uh, where, you, where you are technically based. Uh, and, of course, Kew Gardens is one of the greatest botanical institutions in the world. Um, it, it has, um, as representative, a range of plants from deserts and mountains to tropical jungles to underwater to temperate lands to forests. You have all that in that small area. So it meant that with the help, and not only that, but with the help of of Kew scientists, because Kew is primarily, one might think it's a good place to go on springtime, but, it, but actually it's one of the premier botanical institutions in the world. And to have all their expertise to help you understand what it is you're going to see and what you might see was invaluable. So we were able to shoot desert plants and jungle plants and mountain plants all in that few square miles of Kew, which also happens to be a mile and a half from where I live, which is also a good reason. <laughs> We saved on the travel expenses. Anyway, um, we're going we're to move straight into the app, which we're both very excited about, um, and is another way of exploring the journey. Uh, so here is a glimpse, because most of you might probably have not seen it. Here's a little glimpse of the app. Now, now David, the, uh, I think this is probably definitely your first app. T you know, t talk about the experience of, of what, what we've ended up with in your mind in terms of what it reveals and how the storytelling works. Well, of course, there is one thing that it reveals, uh, which you've just seen there, and which you can play with endlessly. And that is that the, the, the fact that you're able to get a, 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 a flower bud open, and then if you wanted to see just how it opened, you can actually get it closed up again just by taking your finger across the surface of the iPad. So uh, to be able to manipulate it in that sort of way and examine every detail, stop it where you want to see it, see exactly what you do, gives you the chance to see something again, which you wouldn't have been able to see before without the technology that, that people have never seen before. And as you might think that we know everything there is to be known about plants, there's a lot we don't know about plants. Um, and I remember when I first started filming plants and I wanted to, to get a, a, a camera mount and we were going to use time lapse to travel alongside the, the uh, bud, the, the, the leading stem of a bramble as it moved across the ground. I went to botanist and I said, um, how fast, because I'm going to have to program this servo motor because they're going to drive the camera, how fast does a blackberry stem move across the ground? They couldn't tell me. And of course, fair play, I mean, it does depend a bit on the temperature and it does depend a bit on, on, on moisture and so on. But nonetheless, nobody really knew how fast um, it was going to move. 
And so we had to have a number of stabs at it. I mean, to start with, you, you've got to sort of program your, your servo motor on the, on the, with the computer so it moves. And the first time we did it, uh, we were far too slow. And the, the back bay was way ahead there. The camera was still starting <laughs> alongside. And then eventually we got it right. But, but, um, but then you, you suddenly see what technology can show you. But I think it isn't one of the exciting things about, about the app, David, that you, know, you see a film once, you probably go back and watch it again. But this app, if it works the way I think it will do, it will allow people inside Q or outside Q to interact on an ongoing basis with Q. Yeah, I mean, you, in theory, um, and um, you'll be able to go to um, a plant and you'll see a label and it may say amorphophallus titanum, the titanarium. This plant flowers only once every seven years and the plant, the flower, only lasts for three days and it's the biggest flower in the world. Now, two years ago, three years ago, you'd say, well, what a pity it is that I wasn't there on the one day when it was going to flower. How am I going to see it? Now all you can need to do is to touch the part of the label, look at your app, and that plant then blooms in front of your very eyes, which, you know, is, it's a, it was a sight that had not been filmed until I, we, a, a team from the BBC filmed it well, like with me, um, what, 10 years ago, I suppose, in Sumatra. It took us a hell of a long time to find it, and a long time to sit down there waiting for it to do it, but we got it in the end. Well, now you can see it here uh, and make it do, do it whenever you want. And there's a, there seems to be another level also at the app, which is quite nice, which is it allows people to see behind the scenes of Q, which they can't see, and there's whole sections on the app. That's quite important, isn't it, to understand what's going on? Uh, well, it's, it's like all of us, isn't it? I mean, these days, the behind-the-scenes scenes, uh, scenes are, are the things you always want to hear. I mean, uh, we spend hours and hours making natural history films, and, and only when you get marvellous scenes from the back of nature, and all people actually want to see is how it is we made a mess of it when we tried to sort of canoe somewhere or other. <laughs> it's that behind the scenes has this illusion of being let into a secret and seeing the, but it's very popular and I quite understand why and it's very healthy too really actually so that you know there's no, we don't make a mystique of, of, of natural history filming and pretend things uh, are not as they are I mean we spend a lot of time trying to get these captured these scenes but it does no harm at all for people to realize that there is a cameraman there alongside this angry elephant or whatever it is and it is quite an interesting and formidable task that they're taking on. Let's, let's break down a moment of the filming. I mean, we used, I think, nine different, different camera systems in the end, a lot of which had to be adapted and developed, and we didn't know whether they'd work, and we tested them, and some brilliant uh, technical team had behind us managed to modify things. Um, but here, here is a clip of the macro photography in action uh, with the sun juice. So, David, obviously that's, that's in 2D, and in 3D it's even more amazing. But, but what we're seeing there, a lot of people haven't seen before, have they? No, um, sand dew is a common plant in this country. You know, there are a couple of species. In, you go to North Wales or the Lake District of Scotland, you can find it in the bogs, and it's, a, it's only a tiny little thing, you know, about that big. But, and it's um, a, a beautiful plant. But, of course, that movement, you might think it, it is one of the swiftest movements in the plant world. But even so, it's not quick enough for you to actually watch it. If you sit there staring at it, you can't actually see the tentacle move. And even if you did, you can't be sure you did. And, it, it, it's, and that has speeded up, not, not supernaturally, as it were, not hugely, but it's speeded up. Um, hours have been put into minutes, so that's speeded up 40, 50 times. Um, and then you can really see what's happening. And, and, and that's interestingly enough, there's quite a lot of that. You may think botanists know about that and always known about that. But if you, when you watch it on the screen, you'd see that at, if the fly hits a tentacle here, that this tentacle over there starts moving to, to catch the fly like that. These don't bother. So we, it isn't that the fly has just caused a general certain stimulus to the leaf to it to go like that, not at all. It, it is it's this particular one. And nobody knows what the pathway is. No botanist can tell you what the, the nerve or the electric current, which there certainly is, which goes between one and the other, but how it finds its way to that one opposite, we don't know. So there are lots of things we don't know and lots of things a botanist can find out from using techniques like these. <coughs> What's nice on this project is, in a way, we were working with people like Tim Shepard, you'd worked with many years ago, and this, this is sort of the next evolution, isn't it, to do it in 2D and then to do it in 3D? Yes, yes. Interestingly enough, it's easier to shoot time-lapse in 3D than it is to shoot normal films. Because when you shoot 
normally in 3D, you have two cameras which replicate the vision from each of your eyes, as it were. Uh, and of course, the, your eye, this eye gets, your right eye gets a different, slightly different picture from what your left eye does, so particularly for things close up. Um, and it's when your brain is, is, is um, organized to process those two images and make them integrate, it's that that gives you the three-dimensional effect. Uh, and it's, that's the problem when you have the, why the camera, the 3D camera is so big, is that you have two of these cameras alongside one another, and they have to be exactly the same distance as your eyes, uh, because otherwise they won't integrate. But in, in, if you're shooting in, in time-lapse, you, you don't need to bother to have two cameras. You have one still camera, which takes maybe one frame every minute, maybe, which would uh, increase time by 60. Um, and when you take one, and then it goes and it just moves just this distance between two eyes and gets another shot. And the plant hasn't moved enough for, for that any difference to matter. So you then can actually make, paradoxically, a 3D film with a 2D camera, which is quite clever. OK, and another, another technique we used was, was super high-speed cameras. Here they were, they, were called, they were called phantoms, and we had to use two of them. Very expensive to uh, use, they are two. Here is a sequence involving bats, which David will describe afterwards. Okay, now I know all of it wasn't shot in Q before people start wondering where the bats are coming from. Maybe you could describe the sequence, David. That, of course, is the opposite of time-lapse. Yeah. And instead of shooting one frame uh, every um, minute or so, that is producing shooting several hundred frames per second. So it slows down. And when you show it at normal free 25 frames a second, so you can slow the bat movement down. And that's uh, called the, the phantom camera, which you use electronically. In the old days, when you used to use a film, you had to put the film to dash through this camera at such speed that it, it, it sometimes overheated the camera, overheated itself, tangled itself up. I mean, it was a hell of a job. And these days, electronically, you can do that sort of stuff just like that with the phantom. Uh, and it produces this marvelous effect of the bat doing it. Uh, but combining those images of the bats with the images that you take in cue, so to see as, as though the bats are not only flying in slow motion, but are flying inside the glass houses in cue, in cue is, is quite a good trick, I reckon. <laughs> now, um, I'm going to move uh, on to an another clip. Um, and this, this is really about competition among plants. And again, it's what David coin, uh, coins part plant time. So getting into their time so we can see plants doing things we can't normally see them doing. And here's a little clip. Well, those, those pictures, of course, of the plants doing that sort of movement take place not over, over, over minutes or even hours, but over days of the, of the growth of the bamboo, for example. So what happens if you're making uh, time-lapse pictures of, of that means you have to have the same quality light and strength of light uh, during the night as you have during the day. And it's easier, actually, to match that by having artificial light both day and night. Now, when you do that, you have the camera flicking on and take a, taking a shot every, what, five minutes or that sort of thing, or maybe one minute. Um, and uh, so it always has to be the same light. And thus, when you see a sh sequence like that or a shot like that, that was taken over several days. And why the plant is doing this, as you saw it pulsing, uh, is because at night it moves slightly different. It holds its leaves slightly differently. So every one of these is, in fact, the passing of a 24 hours. And that's why it appears to pulse. Now, I, I have to say, a lot of what we did um, did come down to the, uh, to the whole team at Q, didn't it, really, the experts? Because we were sometimes wanting to do things right in the middle of the night, the night flowering cactus. Maybe you can describe that, because, I mean, most people don't get to see that. Indeed so. Um, and we got behind the scenes to see a lot of things, uh, because one of the key things that plants uh, that uh, Q is doing is, A, it has a seed bank, where it is putting seeds from plants all over the world into deep freeze. Well, not all that deep, but in, in chilled conditions. Um, and having in the seed bank down in Surrey, where we've already got uh, tens of thousands of, of, of plant species preserved as seeds. Uh, that's one of the important things they're doing. But they're also doing a lot of conservation. And one of the sequences in the, in the program is about how, in fact, a tiny little water lily, the, wa the smallest water lily in the world, which is only about that much across, and it lived in one particular spring, a volcanic spring, warm spring, 
uh, in Rwanda. And the, the local people, because of one thing or another, suddenly changed their habits and decided to wash their clothes in that spring. And so that actually wiped out that, water, that tiny water lily for good, except that there was one small place where it survived. And the individuals from that, the last living individuals in the wild, were brought back to Kew and to other botanic gardens. And then the problem was, how on earth will you get this to, to germinate? How will you get it to flower and then get seeds from it? Well, we show how that was done. And, uh, and, and it's typical of the many scientific things that, of world importance that are going on in Kew. Now, we, we pretty much caught all the seasons, didn't we? We, had a sort of, we did sort of 10 months, but we were, we were quite lucky. We, well, one of the nine, one of the, there's a very effective sequence uh, when you move, as, as we all know, one of the great plant spectacles in the world is spring. Um, and and we're moving from winter into spring. But one of the great advantages of living so close, as both of us do to, to Q and indeed the camera crew, uh, is that he, Anthony, woke up one morning this last winter and suddenly saw there was nine inches of snow all over the place. And he rapidly rang up all the crew and we had a crew that following day which you got down there. So there's lovely scenes of queue in, in, in winter which is very, very beautiful scenes which you would have missed if it was happening in... We needed, uh, the, we needed all the seasons, didn't yeah, we? That was we it, that was the crowning jury. During, during the end. Thank, thank you to queue for letting us in again in the middle of the unexpected times. Um, the next, the next clip um, is what we coined insect vision because obviously insects are an important part of this series because we explore their relationships with plants. And here's a moment uh, that looks at that. Yeah, well, it is tempting to think that the world looks like the same to everybody. And um, the world appears differently to birds, which can see much more detail than we can. And it certainly looks very different to insects, which operate on different um, uh, wavelengths in, the, in their light-sensitive cells. And that is discovery of looking at plants in infrared. It's an, it, we've got to, we mustn't fool ourselves. We aren't really seeing it like insects because we don't have insect brains for a start. Uh, but, but that gets, a, we suddenly revealed when that work was done some time ago now of using infrared and see, or ultraviolet rather and, and seeing how different plants appear to be whole patterns on the, on, the, on the flowers, on the petals, which we never even saw except in normal light. So it's, um, it does make you realize that every, this, this wonderful world of ours doesn't appear the same to us as it does to many, many other creatures. What's interesting, David, is when, when we did Flying Monsters, obviously, you, you sensibly chose fossils that don't move, and then we brought, <laughs> we brought everything alive using CGI. Uh, penguins, we, we just had to get into the right position. But here, I think we were both surprised, weren't we, by how much we could actually capture. We hardly use CGI at all. We used it once for uh, playing, explaining flowers' position in the hierarchy of plants, didn't we? But no, we hardly touched on it, because we, we, right, we could film what we wanted to film. That's right. I Is that right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I think we were surprised by how much we yeah. got. Um, so, I think um, what I'm going to do now is throw open some questions. So, if we've got some microphones, and if you could raise your hands, let's take some questions from the floor. Hello. Yeah. I was surprised when you said the plants behave differently in day and in night, because you were using artificial light. And I would have thought the constant presence of artificial light would have abolished the so-called diurnal variation of these plants. You are quite correct. I didn't say we use continuous light. I said we use light. <laughs> and when you do it with a flash. At night, you take over and you ensure that your flash is exactly the same as it is during the day. So what you actually do is that you cut out all light during the day and use a flash. And then at night, when it's dark anyway, you use a flash. So there's no... Uh, unevenness in the lighting, but at night the plant most of the time uh, is in darkness. It's only just that flash when it's moving. A good point, if I may say so. <laughs> Next uh, question. Uh, hi, you um, mentioned the challenges of uh, using the 3D cameras and that you perhaps wouldn't take them out and uh, do a wildlife 
film elsewhere because of that. Where do you see this technology going in the future? Do you think there will come a time when you are able to, to maybe film other things in 3D? Um, well, I'm, w there are still lots of things that you can do without using... I mean, we haven't always had long lenses, and we, and we made quite reasonable films. Um, and in fact, you have to choose your subjects very carefully so that uh, Anthony and I uh, are going to join a team which, as we speak, is filming away in the Galapagos Islands. Why did we choose the Galapagos? Because the animals in the Galapagos, as so famously, they are not at all afraid of human beings. Even the 3D camera trundling along with all its attendants won't put off a, a, a marine iguana or a giant tortoise or, or indeed an albatross. So in the, the Galapagos, we will have no problem. It's worth just um, perhaps trying to explain why, what the problem is with long lenses. Um, if, you, if you look at your finger with, with one eye and two eyes, you'll see different views. But if you looked at something uh, in the other end of this hall, you would see exactly the same with your, with your eyes. What a long lens does is it gives you an impression that you've just got a close-up. But So the only way you would get a different view is if you separated those two cameras so that they that they're a long way away, they would actually give you a different view. But if they're a long way away, that one shoots like that, the other shoots like that, and the background, because they're cross-shooting, is different. So the, camera, so the images won't integrate. Now that seems to me um, a, a fundamentally difficult problem to solve. On the other hand, if you had told someone 50, no, 100 years ago, I wanted to develop a device which is going to send a picture through the air, and so you can turn on a little box in your front room and you'll, get, you'll be able to see it, you would think they were crazy. So I equally then recognize that there will be some bright spark that's going to solve that particular problem. But at the moment, it is a major problem, and it is a major problem for people like me making natural history films. Over here, please. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, um, how do you make the decisions about sound effects when you're using um, yeah. the, the slow mo? Well, it's not slow motion, it's stop motion, yeah. is it? Yeah. Is that just the technicians in the editing room who just decide, or? Uh... Well, uh, I'm, you're quite right, and you're quite to raise it. I mean, it is it is a bit of one might like to call it, if rather portentously, artistic license. I mean, the thing is that when you see those tendrils of convolvulus doing that. Now, in, in life, of course, the, the, you can't even see the movement. When you see it like that, in order to give an impact of what it is, we took a liberty and put a <laughs> And we had to restrain ourselves, because when, <laughs> when you get the, those pitcher plants, the penthes, and when the lid comes off, it's very tempting to go, you know, <laughs> but, but, we, but we didn't do that, but we did do the <laughs> Yeah, quite right. Over here. Um, hi. Um, you seem to be the only kind of person that can actually make these programs. I mean, I, I mean, I mean you've been doing this all of your life, and there, uh, and, and there doesn't seem to be anyone else that can, you know, sort of either take over in the future. And, and you've never had any kind of rivals in this field. I mean, why do you think that is so? And are you looking for, for some kind of apprentice? Not me. <laughs> <laughs> that mean perhaps Cameron Diaz. I don't know. Uh, well, I, you better ask. Um, Ask some broadcasters about that. I mean, the thing is that in many ways I'm a bit of a dinosaur. I'm, I'm a bit of a, an old-fashioned filmmaker. Um, and when I started making naturalist films, which was a long time ago, um, uh, what one was wanting to do was to show as closely as you can the behavior of some animal or other. Um, and, but these days you can get perhaps an even larger audience if you combine that sort of storytelling with an adventure story. I have nothing against it. I mean, part of the fun I have in making natural history films is that I have a lot of fun as in, in, in an adventurous sense. And so quite a lot of the um, natural history films now these days have that element in them. Um, which gives the personality involved, the presenter involved, some way of uh, establishing his identity. Uh, but but that, that never was my particular style, and I've just stuck to this rather old-fashioned way of doing things. What's been the most amazing moment of your career, or at least one of them? I really don't know. I mean, there's so many. I mean, I suppose... Uh, I could quote you a lot of things, but, but if, if I was giving you an absolutely straightforward and honest answer, 
I would think that the, the one single moment, and it's what you asked for, the one single moment which was revelatory and breathtaking and unforgettable was the first time I put on an aqualung and dived on a coral reef. I mean, diving in itself, uh, though I'm sure lots of people here are divers, and they will testify to the fact that just finding yourself weightless and being able to move in three dimensions with no effort at all, just a flip of, the, of your flipper on, the, on your feet, and just sailing up and down or going down to the depths, that is a miracle. But when you do it on a, ba on a coral reef, where the uh, abundance of form and beauty and color um, is, is limitless, it's, it's almost intoxicating. And you can hardly believe it is as beautiful as it is. And it's a bit of a mystery as to why it's so beautiful it is. The, the, why the, color, the coral reef is colored as vividly and beautifully and extravagantly as it is, is quite a puzzle. And don't you believe any scientist who says that it's not a puzzle? It is a puzzle. Over here. Okay. Uh, uh, good afternoon, Sir David. Uh, I'm quite interested in the relationship between the film and the narration, both of which, in my experience, tend to be brilliant. Is the film made and then you narrate it? Or do you have a narration and then they produce a film? And secondly, is there ever any friction between the two of you? Um, well, there are lots of ways of doing it, um, and uh, you can, and, and if, it, if I've got a film with a scientific basis about, let us say, the evolution of snakes, I will um, work out um, what the animals I would need, lizards I would need to show, the uh, four-footed lizard, and then lizards with little relic feet, and then underground, so I know what the story is. And, and then you, you do the research and find where the animals are that would illustrate that. And you talk to the cameramen and say, this is what we do uh, and what we want. And they will go away and do it. Now, if they see something which would be quite new that I hadn't put in the script, let us say they saw a snake underground because they'd set up a, a system and, they, and it did something very strange, I don't know, mated underground or something. Just because I hadn't written it into the script, they wouldn't then not take it. Of course they would. And I would, I hope, have enough sense and, and uh, malleability to say, that's great, we, we, we will put it in. So that produces what you might call the rushes, what the film business call the rushes. Um, and then a, a, an editor, which is a very skilled job, puts it together. But, and and there, some editors will be very kind to me and say, oh, look, if you've got a bit of theory in, um, I'll leave you space for that. But in my view, I, I, I try not to take advantage of that because I, there are psychological experiments to show that if you have a, a message which is told in vision and a message which is told in sound, vision always wins, always wins. So the, the image is dominant to the word. And I would like to say to the editor, and do say to the editor, look, please put it together so that you can tell the story as clearly as possible in vision. If, if they don't need any commentary at all, that's great and good on you. But um, maybe a word here and there would help. You know? but, but that's the way it should be. So I had hardly ever say to a, a film editor, look, please give me space here to, to put in theory or something. You tell the story and I'll add only those words that are necessary. Um, you spoke about voice over there and your recording. We all know your voice for years and it's great to hear you talk here. Do you ever have to do a retake? Do you ever do, do, you ever do a retake? Of do a retake? Oh, oh, you mean do I do? You're, you're a one-take wonder, aren't you, David? I've, I've, been, <laughs> I've, I've been just coming straight from recording some, uh, some stuff this afternoon in which the editor had the nerve to say, you didn't say that very well. <laughs> and, and I, and I, 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 I knew he went out and took his bar of chocolate away. I mean, uh, what a nerve. But, um, I mean, yes, there's a certain amount of to and fro. <laughs> yeah, I can tell you it didn't go down very well. <laughs> we had a quick exit. We got here much quicker than I expected down the high street. <laughs> <laughs> yep, we've got time for a couple more questions. So here we go. Yep. Hello. Um, this is from my six-year-old nephew. He wanted me to ask you, um, why are parakeets in this country 
And how did they get here? Because they weren't always here, is that right? Um, in the 1920s, and they've been here much, much longer than people think. Yeah. Um, in the 1920s and, and around that period, um, about 100 years ago, it was very fashionable. Wealthy millionaires who owned big country estates liked to have uh, decorative animals and birds around. Um, and they introduced, there wasn't any law to stop them doing so, and they introduced interesting things. They introduced wallabies. Um, the, the, uh, the Romans introduced uh, rabbits um, the, and dormice. Uh, and these people in the 20s introduced tropical birds. Um, and the green parakeet it actually comes from a climate not dissimilar from ours. It comes from the foothills of the Himalayas, amongst other places, uh, where it's quite temperate. So they do very well. Um, and they first started appearing around 1920. You can find records from, from then. And they remained just one here, one there, sufficiently rare for people to say, good gracious, I saw a parrot in my garden this morning, until about 10, 15 years ago, when suddenly they're phew. I mean, and I get parties of 20 of them in my garden in Richmond, you know. Um, and it's, again, it's a little scientific mystery. There's some tipping point when animals will just manage to, to, to limp along, as it were, just with very, very small numbers. Then something happens. Maybe it's just one particular patch of weather, or maybe it's an introduction of some food or something. But suddenly, then, it zooms up, and that's what's happened to parrots. And I, I fear that what's going to happen is that, that they are going to continue increasing and now they've been established until they become something of a pest. And if I was a fruit farmer and, and had uh, you know, my plum trees crop just come after a year and a flock of those parrots came on, on the ground, I mean, he would be ruined. So there's some cause for concern. Right, we're going to have one more question uh, in the middle over here. I just wanted to ask, what do you think about zoos? Do you think they're an important thing for us to learn from? species we don't really know about or see naturally here or do you have the urge to sort of unlock all the doors and let the animals into the park <laughs> what do i think about that? zoos would zoos. You, are you, are you, are you, oh, zoos would you rather open the zoos. doors i i zoos can do three very valuable things um they can um educate in the sense that it's you can you can see all of the picture images, television images of elephants that you like, until you've actually stood alongside one and smelt one and heard its belly rumbling and seen the size of the thing, you don't really understand the, the essence of elephantness, as it were. That's one thing. Uh, the second thing is that there's an awful lot still that is very difficult for us to learn about animals uh, when they're in the wild. There are lots that you can learn about it in captivity. So there's science research, which is the second thing. The third thing um, is that, um, sadly, there are some creatures which are so endangered in the wild now because of changing climate or because of what we have done in terms of introducing um, uh, competitors or changing the environment, where they are on the verge of ex extinction. And what you can do then is to take the, the animal and put them in a zoo and keep them going until conditions are restored when you can put them back. A recent problem at the moment amongst amphibians, tropical amphibians and frogs, is a particular kind of fungus which is sweeping the world, which probably results in fact of something that we have been doing, which I won't go into. But nonetheless, it is going around the world and it, is, it, is, it, it covers the, the skin of an amphibian or a frog so effectively that the frog can't breathe because it breathes through its skin. Now, what we are now doing is getting containers the size of a sea container and turning them into um, uh, lo effective laboratories where clinical conditions are such that you can keep them absolutely free of any outside influences that sort they're uh, quite easy to breed and you can breed them so there will be colonies of these things around zoos around the world because we're all cooperating on that sort of thing and if and when this cartridge fungus we know how to deal with it or it's run its course we can bring those frogs back to the original environment. But all those three things depend on the animals being kept in proper circumstances. We know a lot more about how animals can be kept happy in zoos. Not all animals. You can't keep eagles happy in zoos. In my view, you can't really keep lions happy in zoos. But a lot of animals you can. Um, and and uh, providing that that is the case, then I think zoos are justified. What is not justified 
uh, is keeping animals in appropriate zoos and animals in bad conditions where they are bored silly uh, and, and it, it pains me to go and see such zoos. There aren't many in this country, if any. I don't know of one in this country. I know plenty elsewhere in the world. Um, I think we can go on here taking questions all day, but we're going to have to wind it up. Um, a very big thank you to Apple and the Apple Store here for staging this event today. For Sky 3D, without, without question, who we would not be able to be making these 3D films, all at Atlantic Productions. Boto Media for working with us on the app. Um, on site, our, our, our facilities house. I just want to mention very quickly, because uh, he'll be listening, I'm sure, to this in Galapagos, uh, our series director, Martin. Uh, Williams, cameraman uh, Tim Craig, editor Peter Miller, if he recovers from the recording today, uh, and uh, to the Royal Botanical Gardens at Kew, who have been an amazing collaborators on this project. I can't say enough good things about them. Um, when I grew up, um, it's strange to be sitting on this stage in some ways. I grew up watching David Attenborough like a lot of other people. Um, and he's, in, he's managed to captivate generation after generation. What's interesting is... Last night, I attempted uh, and gave to my two-year-old twins uh, the, an iPad with the app on it. And half an hour later, they were still going strong, mesmerized by, by the journey that David was taking them on this film. The amazing thing that David has is David actually really understands the technology. He always pretends to me he doesn't, and comes up with very clever ways of using it. Put that together with brilliant storytelling, and you have someone who works on any medium. So in this project, David is going to take us on journeys on the giant screen, on, you know, obviously on an app, on 3D, on 2D. We're actually going to have a Nintendo experience, which we're going to launch as well, so you can watch it in 3D on Nintendo. The great skill that David has and the brilliance he has is to work across all these mediums. David Attenborough, thank you very much. You're very kind. Thank you very much. <laughs>